Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. Before I get going on today's monster, um, I wanted to take a moment in memoriam. Um, writing and books end up featuring on this podcast quite a bit. I end up incorporating a lot of, uh, say, literature, novel, short fiction, even discussions of my own work, uh, having other writers on here. And so since that tends to be the case, mostly because of who I am and what my interests are, um, I should mention that we just saw the passing of a great American short story master, Lee K. Abbott. Um, he's a fantastic writer. I first ran into his fiction as an undergraduate in college. Um, in a literature textbook, I ran into his story, uh, One of Star Wars, One of Doom, and it blew my mind. And it's essentially... Um, that one was this weird, it, well, not weird, it was this expertly crafted experiment in shifting perspectives um, on a day in which there's a Columbine like school shooting. And so it shifts from what will be the victims through the shooters' minds themselves and elsewhere. He did all sorts of amazing stuff with his fiction. That's just one of many. He has many books out there. Um, and I very much encourage you to go out and check out his fiction that he left behind if you have not yet found it. Um, in addition to being a, ma being, a, being a masterful writer, Lee K. Abbott uh, was a genuinely good guy and a great teacher and he was he was much kinder to me than he had any reason to be <laughs> I, mean, I only got to meet him in person like one like hang out with him just one time i think maybe twice one or one once or twice and um would just drop him a note every now and then over the years and then when i had my own short store a collection coming out recently i contacted him and asked him, hey, I know it's a long shot and I know the answer is no, but would you read my book and give me a blurb? And he's like, absolutely, I'd love to. I'm thinking, Jesus, I can't imagine he had to have the time to do such favors for people like me, but sure enough, he did. And then um, at the beginning of this year, I got the this, this sad note from him and um, many others found out as well that he was diagnosed with a severe form of leukemia and only very recently recently did it finally take him so we lost uh, a great american master of the short story and all i can really do is encourage readers and listeners go check out his stuff because if you haven't read it yet it'll blow your mind it's fantastic uh, here's to a great writer and a great guy lee k abbott so for today's episode I um, suppose I was inspired by a series of, well, one night of a whole bunch of dreams. So a series of dreams that all stacked together on one night. Um, and I think it was because before I went to bed, I watched an episode of Drunk History. I don't know if you know this show. It's a, it's a show by this uh, comedian um, named Derek Waters. No relation to John Waters, even though they're both from Baltimore. Um, and he has drunk people on there trying to tell... Uh, important moments of his uh, stories from important moments of history and he's got one hilarious insane comedian on there he's trying to tell the story of Frankenstein and you know it's a it's a pretty basic uh, telling of of how Frankenstein came to be and in fact we've we've covered it um, they covered Frankenstein ever so briefly on the show in the first three episodes uh, monsters and literature 
And then that night, I just kept dreaming about different versions of Frankenstein over and over again. (laughs) I thought, okay, I haven't yet done or dedicated a full episode to just Frankenstein. It's time to do it. So here we go. Frankenstein. (laughs) Alive. (laughs) It's alive. It's alive! If you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where fashion sits? <laughs> Different types who wear a day coat, pants with stripes, or cutaway coat, perfect fits. All right, so where to start with the discussion of Frankenstein? I know we need to really get going with the original book by Mary Shelley. However, I think we should start at a different point than that because most people know Frankenstein first and foremost from the images out of film um, in, in any of the various incarnations of Frankenstein. And one of the first things that pops up every time is, are you allowed to say Frankenstein in reference to the monster, the creation. And that's one of the first kind of nitpicky monster-like things that you'll hear from any one person to another if they go, oh, my favorite monster is Frankenstein. They'll go, no, Frankenstein was the guy who made him. It wasn't the monster himself. And then maybe you think, oh, although Frankenstein was the name of the med student who created created the monster by the end of the book you realize that although Frankenstein wasn't the monster Frankenstein was the monster in the classic horror reverse as we've talked about on a previous episode in horror structure so are you allowed to say Frankenstein is a monster of course you are (laughs) because he was a monster um okay what about the creation itself well, he didn't really have a name in the book, um, and he's very rarely given any names in other incarnations of the story. Mary Shelley herself, I think it was in a talk she gave, or maybe it was a letter she's written. Now I'm, I'm having trouble remembering where it came from, but she at least once referred to him as Adam. Um, which makes sense, you know, this, this, uh, the first creation of this man, um, what name do you give him? You give him the name Adam. And I think there's a little bit of connection there to some Gollum stories. Um, but before we go down that rabbit hole, um, I didn't really have a name in the story at all. Just this monster, this creation, this creature, which it, creatures, another is cognate with the word creation, something. Um, but I'll take a stance and I'll defend the more popular uh, quote-unquote misconception that you can call the monster itself Frankenstein. Because when you see a Ford driving down the road, you don't say, oh, that's a Henry Ford's vehicle. That's a vehicle created by Henry Ford or Henry Ford's company's vehicle. You call it a Ford. If you're going to call it something, you say it's a Ford. Well, if you're going to call that a Ford, why can't you call a thing created by Frankenstein a Frankenstein? And if he created many more uh, in the book, he started to create a second one. (laughs) But if he had stayed in business and kept churning them out, they'd be a whole bunch of Frankensteins. And then somebody else would come along and make some and they would be a competing brand of human. Actually, I've just laid out a really horrifying story. (laughs) And that's a, that is a, you know, if you start mass producing, not just robots as we've kind of done in stories now, but um, factories in fact, of of these of these mons these flesh undead monsters coming um that is horrifying maybe i'll write that story <laughs> or or you get to it first if you if you like it anyway i've co- okay i've got i've gotten way off track so i'll i'll interchange the two and there's my defense so attack it if you will and if you want to uh, argue with me on the show at some point come on i'll take you on so with all that said, 
the book, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, came out in, what, 1818. And, oh, she was, you know what, I think, I think maybe one of the first points we should, we should notice is how young she was when she wrote this thing. She was 18 years old when she started writing it, and she was finished by 19, and it was finally published and distributed and made available at 20. And so and that's a pretty quick turnaround for a book anyway by the year from start to publication, two years. Um, but so she wrote this thing essentially as a damn teenager, that's insane. <laughs> and it's insane. And it's not, it's the level of sophistication and complexity of the prose and of the writing itself. Um, not only I say, would say rivals that of Bram Stoker uh, and Dracula. I think that the two get compared a lot and I think that's fair, but, um, but not only rivals, but defeats Bram Stoker. She's a much better, smarter, and more sophisticated writer than Bram Stoker on at least the intellectual level. And at 18, 19, that's insane. In fact, um, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was uh, Guillermo del Toro, the great the great uh, director, Mexican director, uh, who made some of the best horror films of all time who really gets who really gets some of the great well he really gets everything great that re, that relates to monsters he's on my dream list of guests on this show one day it'll never happen but i can dream can't i uh he said something to the effect in an interview um that to him frankenstein was like the like the teenage novel like so the monster in the novel is like he's alone in the world he's abandoned in the world there's he doesn't fit in in any way uh his parent his only parent is neglectful and abusive in that way and has nothing to like give him or prepare him in no way preps him for the world and just throws him out there and how many teens when they're feeling that that swelling of angst rising up especially maybe toward the end of their teens are feeling like they're the only ones in the world no one else understands them they're starting to see how hard and cruel the world is and they feel unprepared and they're mad at the people who brought him into this world and they never asked to be in here and they're full of all this potential but it was incorrectly honed when the parent had the chance that's all the story of frankenstein and so if you're a teen and you're feeling like that and you read a book and it reflects all that uh that's all well and good and it and it also happens to have been written by a teen which makes it even fit together more i think guillermo del toro is really on to something there um we, we, I think at least my inclination is to interpret it more as, um, a kind of a romantic with a capital R novel as in a reaction against the enlightenment and rational thinking and, and worshiping the God of progress and technology. Uh, but re- perhaps the truer way to look at it is a teen angst novel written by actually a teen. Um, it's, it's fascinating to think of it that way. Okay. So what was this teen inspired by? What got her going on? Well, you, you recall perhaps in a previous episode, and you've probably already heard this. If you're at all interested in monsters, anyway, you've heard this before, I'm sure. But this story came about on a magical, strange night in 1816. You've got Mary Shelley, with, well, she wasn't Mary Shelley at the time, Mary Godwin, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin. Um, she uh, was vacationing with her lover, the famous poet, Percy Shelley, and you and you might know his uh, 
I guess most famous poem, Ozymandias, yeah, that's Shelley. And so she, and he's married to somebody else at the time. He's running off with, with, uh, with Mary. And so they're together. They, um, end up going to a chateau in Switzerland with meeting up with Lord Byron, the famous poet. He has his physician that he keeps with him at all times, John Polidori. And they can't go out and do all their beautiful hiking and aristocratic vacationing, whatever rich people do for vacations. I don't know what they do. I don't know, skip through the tulips and sing poetry to each other and do mescaline or something. I don't really know. But uh, then I guess it would be opium at that time. Anyway, uh, but they can't go out and do all that stuff because the weather is so harsh and cold and stormy because a volcano erupted on the other side of the world and it's changed the atmosphere across all the across the northern hemisphere and they call it the year without summer and they get the temperatures drop and they get strange weather and so they're stuck inside in this dark stormy night and they start sharing ghost stories and i think it was by lord byron although it might have been one of the other ones who proposed a contest let's tell let's find out who can tell the best ghost story and as they branch off to go think through the stories they want to tell or the best terrifying horror tale as they branch off, um, Lord Byron's physician, John Polidori, comes up with a story about a vampire in which it's this aristocratic, very Lord Byron-esque <laughs> kind of character who's a vampire. That ends up being the primary inspiration later for Bram Stoker's Dracula, who takes who takes uh, that kind of aristocratic old world vampire uh, very seriously throughout a whole novel and just takes some of the, the foppish kind of dandy <laughs> side of Lord Byron out of the character and makes him a bit more vicious and Eastern and mysterious in that way. But Mary, Mary went off, Mary Godwin went off and pieced together this story that she ended up calling Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Not too long before that, she had, uh, in her travels, visited Frankenstein Castle in Germany, um, Odenwald, I think it is. Let me check. I have notes here. I should check them every now and then. Yeah, Odenwald, Germany. Um, so she saw, she saw that castle and that got in her head, as did the name, I think. Um, she, galvanism was also hitting the news and people were, were talking about it. Galvanism essentially was this discovery of this like electrochemical reaction uh, of muscles, even of dead muscles, but of any kind of muscles, they'll respond or contract. Well, all a muscle can do is contract actually and so muscles will start working uh with when you manipulate that electrochemical um uh, mechanism for lack of a better term and so if you you can just pump something with electricity and the muscles will contract or even uh, affect it with salt um <clears throat> with uh, doses of salt uh i remember <laughs> As a kid, I guess experimenting in proto-galvanism myself, um, we'd go out frog gigging all the time. I'm from Kentucky, by the way, so we did things like go out and frog gig and uh, go out to the swamps with homemade gigs. They're like they're like very tiny tritons on the ends of very long sticks so weird triton spears where you put on your rubber boots and you go in the middle of the night through the swamp with a flashlight and a wall <laughs> plastic walmart sack or something and you paralyze the frogs with your light and then you stab them and you bring them back and you fry up the frog legs and you have the frog legs and you put salt on them or you pop them in salt water and they'll start kicking even these disembodied legs they'll start kicking that was uh that was about the time um i first read frankenstein and so the two images are kind of tied up in my mind in this horrifying way and now maybe you get them tied up in your mind as well um so 
So those are a couple of inspirations and in where the story came from and it really took over and you can see why essentially it's a story of this meds and this medical student Victor Frankenstein um, and I've always got to check myself because I almost always say Frankenstein Frankenstein, uh, Frankenstein, uh, Frankenstein, um, doing the young Frankenstein, Gene Wilder thing. We've got to get to that in a minute. But anyway, this, uh, so this med student, it occurs to the, the secret of giving life to inanimate, an inanimate body finally occurs to him on this dark stormy night in a flash of lightning. Now that suggests that it has to do with lightning, but the book never really says it is electricity that I realized or that Frankenstein realized. And so, um, and so he ends up creating this oversized man who is inanimate and then he applies this secret and it becomes animate and alive although the story actually begins in the arctic when he is in by the diary of this arctic explorer explorer who finds this strange dude he's on the run from this monster he's created and then we get the backstory and how the creation happened and then the the novel shifts and picks up with the perspective of the creation himself and how he awakes animate and alive and a full-grown adult with a highly intelligent brain um, but with a, otherwise a blank slate and he is he finds himself very immediately abandoned in the world and he finds everyone reacting to him quite horribly and so he has to hide and survive as best he can and try to learn about the world and get the best education he can by sneaking and hiding into other people's houses and listening to them and watching them until he gets powerful enough to confront his master, tries to force his, uh, or creator, not master, his creator, because in all ways he is greater than his creator. He's bigger, he's stronger, he's faster, and most importantly, he's smarter and also more vicious now because he's full of angst and anger. Uh, tries to make Frankenstein uh, create amends uh, by creating him, say, uh, a, a partner as well. At the very last minute, uh, Victor Frankenstein tears the, his his uh, amending like a bride of Frankenstein apart. Therefore, the monster exacts his revenge and then chases Victor Frankenstein around the world until he finally gets him and finally catches up with him at the North Pole and finds him dead. And so he never even gets to fully enact his revenge. And then they float off into the icy ocean in this kind of deeply sorrowful moment at the end. That's the entire book for you. I'm not worried about spoiling it for you. You had since 1818 to read it and you have many, many film versions of it. I think there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in there. Um, I think that, well, at least to me, the setting the, at the beginning of the and the end of the Arctic really matters. Um, the that the monster awakens highly intelligent but otherwise a blank slate of a mind and he educates himself really matters to me um, he learns from people but he also reads a lot and he happens to read things that fit the theme of the book such as milton's paradise lost um, where he sees himself as a creation that could have been something transcendent, but instead has fallen into the demonic. Um, and at, at the same time, having been done wrong, and that's why he was cast down, much like Milton Satan uh, considers his own perspective. So it was also called the modern Prometheus. Why in the world was it called that? Uh, Prometheus was a titan in Greek mythology. 
He's probably most popular for being the one who steals fire from the gods, specifically from Zeus, and gives it to mere human beings. And he is eternally punished for that kind of thing. And so it could, in that perspective, refer the subtitle of the book, refer to Victor Frankenstein, the creator who steals life force from God and gives it to his creation and therefore brings about his own down tragic downfall. Um, another way to think about it though, is that, well, I guess that's the, I guess that's the best way to think about it as Frankenstein being, uh, Victor Frankenstein being the Prometheus. Cause in, in other versions of the Prometheus tale, Prometheus actually creates human beings at the behest of Zeus, forms them out of clay and then also gives them fire. Um, and he was wrong in doing so in all these ways. I think I I think there are ways to in fact interpret the monster a, a little bit as a type of modern Prometheus, um, as this inhuman thing um, who ends up possessing the fire of the gods and is and is and is punished for it. Um, but in a in a kind of tangential connection, um, I. Just on the very basic level, what does the Frankenstein monster look like? Since the 1930s films with Boris Karloff, uh, the whole concept that we have visually of him in popular culture is that he is assembled from all these different dead body parts of, of corpses, and he's sewn together and forged and woven together so that... He, we've created kind of this uh, a collage of a human with full of nasty stitches and perhaps even misproportioned like arms and and like bolts sticking out of his neck. I think even shows up in some of them, and um, and he is animated through the use of lightning or or extreme electricity. But the book never, the original never really clarifies that it was electricity, nor does it clarify that he was necessarily stitched together from a whole bunch of different parts. It suggests all that. So I think all of that is fair. But, and I was, I was well aware of the, the movies and I had seen a, at least a couple of them before I, I first read the book. But even with that in my mind, when I first read the book, the image I had was, and given to me from the book, is this perfectly proportioned, gigantic statue, like this this um, classical statue. When you see a sculpture uh, in marble at a museum, say, of, uh, of a Greek figure or, or a Roman figure and they're overly muscular and they're oversized and they're perfect, but they're cold and dead and, and marble in their face. And, and, and even the face doesn't quite look right. It's, it's amazing, but not comforting in any way. And if it started moving and looking at you, you'd be absolutely fucking terrified. <laughs> um, Cause maybe I'm the only person who goes around museums being terrified, but, but they're terrifying and, and beautiful simultaneously. And that's how the monster was described. It's gigantic and it's perfect. And in that perfection, it's horrifying. Now you still do get yellow eyes and you get to see the arteries under the skin. And so that's horrifying, but it's not the same kind as we often get in the films. I'm not saying the films do it wrong. I think that's a legitimate interpretation, but I always saw it as speaking of Prometheus, uh, Ridley Scott, uh, started uh, in recent years doing uh, alien related films that he calls Prometheus and the space pilots I think is how they act the, that horrible term that they accidentally got stuck with about what these alien creatures are that's how I picture that's how I uh, always pictured Frankenstein's monster which was this giant uh, perfect um, Roman or Greek sculpture 
uh, uh, marble pale and features that are complete and human, but not detailed enough to look entirely finished. And I, that totally fits not only uh, the process by which Victor Frankenstein creates the monster in the novel, uh, but I think fits the description as well. Um, so, so that's my version of it. But it first started showing up in film. Uh, the story sh- uh, first showed up in film before the 1930s, actually. Thomas Edison and his crew filmed a version of it in 1910. And it's amazing for its time. The monster in that one, however, looks like a looks like a drunken troll <laughs> or something like that. He's got this weird, crazy hair that's way too big. It's like a it's like an electrified uh, hair rocker from the 1980s. He's got this cross-eyed, strange face. He's he's like bulky at the shoulders and lanky and clawed at the and in the in the arms and hands and if I'm remembering correctly, he rises up out of this cauldron of alchemy and he's this living thing. Um, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. I think that's where I first saw it. So check out Thomas Edison's 1910 Frankenstein. Uh, don't be too prepared to be horrified <laughs> necessarily. And it was amazing for its time, but you kind of, you, when you're watching it, you're kind of wishing, uh, that George Millet who did the, um, you know, the, the voyage to the moon and those kinds of stories, you kind of wish that he had tackled it instead of Edison. Um, so, uh, the night, I think the, the real iconic transition from Frankenstein out of, out of literature into real popular culture came with James Wales films, uh, the 1931, uh, Frankenstein, uh, I think it was a couple years later, or I don't know, maybe five years later, something like that, uh, Bride of Frankenstein. And those are good films, and those scared the hell out of people at the time, but also really started bringing up the questions in a lot of people's minds that I think the book was all about, which was essentially... Uh, how far is too far in the worship of progress and power and knowledge and technology? And does that lead to a point where we're creating monsters that are turning and destroying us? And in the process, we destroy ourselves before they can even get to us, which is what happens with Victor Frankenstein, right? By the time the monster finally catches up with him in the abstract and cold uh, peak uh, of nature, the Arctic, that point in nature that is above all the rest of the world, but primordial in its, in its abject emptiness, that right at the beginning or at the pinnacle of the the link between the earth and the rest of the cold universe that's the arctic or at least that's how it works so well in my mind in the story and and that's where the creator ends up going and finally dies just minutes before the creature can get his hand on him and so you create this monster out in the world and you've destroyed yourself as the monster but the monster or still comes back for you anyway. Um, what kinds of lessons about the world, uh, or what what in the world could that lesson be applied to in the 1930s? I think a whole lot. Right after the Great War, uh, World War II is building up and is on its way. Um, and it's been a worry. Well, ever since hell, Mary, uh, Mary Shelley was worried about that kind of thing back in 1818. She was a part of a tradition we call in literature and arts, we call the romantics. And among the romantics, you might name, uh, poets like, you know, Wordsworth or Keats, also Shelley and Lord Byron, but also Mary Shelley as well. Um, and essentially One way to envision the romantics is a reaction against this overly rational, overly logical um, insistence on this um, progress 
technology, law, and order, and, and control of the world through through science and logic and, and, and industry and this kind of thing. And instead, the Romantics were interested in mysteries and truth and nature and art and, and emotion and how all of that is fundamental to the fabric of the universe. And so, and so you have... Uh, Frank and normally the romantics are also associated with optimism rather than pessimism, except for one branch of the romantics would, which went in a Gothic and dark and more horror direction. Um, that's what we get out of Frankenstein. Um, the, and HP and HP Lovecraft, by the way, I think had a wonderful three part model of how to think about such stories. You know what? Maybe we'll save that one for an H.P. Lovecraft discussion because I want to get back to some more Frankenstein films. Um, so I, yeah, those films are great. But I'll tell you what the 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 nineteen the early the early film versions of Frankenstein that really got me of all of them. The one that I enjoyed the most was one that's kind of looked down upon. It seems as kind of a trashy knockoff, um, and it's. Son of Frankenstein, and that was 1939, and that's the one where you finally get to see the the lab assistant Igor, uh, spelled Y G O R or Y G O R in that film, and that's played by Bella Lugosi, whom it was said was first offered the role that Boris Karloff took of um, he was already so famous from Dracula. Uh, that they offered uh, the role of playing the monster in Frankenstein to him, and he turned it down because you had to act through all this horrendous makeup, and and it wasn't like sexy and cool enough for him like Dracula was, and so they gave it to Karlov, and of course that totally launched Karlov's career, and that was kind of the beginning of the end for for poor Bella. Um, and there's something to the not wanting to go through the torture of that makeup, though. Um, Boris Karlov had to every single day for hours. I think it was something like five hours of makeup a day because they couldn't just apply the prosthetics like they do now, where they already have, say, the silicone pieces of the face or the or the 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 cap, the skull cap, or or. Um, cowl or any of these kinds of things they had to recreate it from scratch every single day of shooting and so many days he would just go home with the monster makeup sleep as best he could without disturbing disturbing it and come back so he wouldn't have to go through all that again but they would like they would like rip out pieces of cotton from scratch with glue and plaster and all the various um, I, I'm say glue and plaster. I'm just making that up. I don't really know what they use. I've watched every episode of every season of face off the monster makeup competition. And I still couldn't tell you what they used back then. Um, so they, uh, but mixing up gooey stuff with plastic and from scratch reforming this face and this monster makeup every single day. And on top of that, wearing this, this weird outfit, he had four inch platform boots that each weighed 11 pounds, 22 pounds of boots on your feet, walking around all day, this horrendous makeup. Um, you'd have to pay somebody a lot of money to do that for as long as they spent shooting. But the, okay, where was I? Oh, son of Frankenstein, man, that one really gets me because unlike the, the Frankenstein and bride of Frankenstein, that one really feels like a horror movie to me. Uh, that that has the heart of the horror film. It starts already in the place where the monster in the past had done his rampage, and you have as the son of Frankenstein coming back to this traumatized uh, Bavarian village to inherit uh, Victor Frankenstein's castle 
And in, in the movies, he's a doctor, not just a student. And he has means, of course, and he owns a castle and stuff. Um, that he's coming back to inherit all this stuff and planning, of course, in no way whatsoever to repeat the sins of the father. And so you already have somebody coming back to a place with deep history and horrific trauma and dark memories and this this crime that is destined to recur and he's tied up in the middle of it and that's all and and that's at the heart of the horror story in addition to that this in son of frankenstein they take extra steps to show how isolated this place is how hard it is to get to or out of and it seems so much more isolated visually it has although it's inferior in in many ways to the original uh it still has this german expressionism kind of starkness in the sets that they have that's reminiscent i would say of of say cabinet of dr caligari um and and the the Frankenstein character in in this movie has to deal with people who were uh, surviving v- uh, victims of the monster's previous attack. Even the the constable the constable dude, or I forget exactly what his rank is, but it's like his maimed arm because as a child uh, the monster r- ripped his arm off <laughs> or broke his arm into shreds. Um, just by trying to hold him. Um, and, and that's something actually on a tangent that I should have brought up before that I haven't, uh, and how it, how it hits the heart so much is that once you get to see the story from the monster's perspective, as Mary Shelley gave, you see how, how much he just wants to love and be loved and yet he's so misunderstood and he can't really find his place i think that hits back at the heart of it being perhaps a teen book and a teen story but it hits uh, as we've been discussing it approaches so many so many bigger themes anyway i'm a huge fan of son of frankenstein and apparently mel brooks was too because young frankenstein is essentially his parody not of frankenstein and not so much bride of frankenstein although there are hints of both of those in there but essentially it's the same plot as son of frankenstein um and young frankenstein is 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 one of the great comedy films, I think. I didn't get it when I was younger. It was just funny enough, but a lot of the humor was kind of outdated even when I first saw it, which was a long time ago. Uh, Part of that was just Mel Brooks style, but not until I was a little bit older and I go back and rewatch it and then rewatch it again do I realize how brilliant it is. First of all, the the comedy is, is classic and it's solid comedy throughout. Um, classic and all the way like back to the vaudeville style uh, and, and including modern comedy style but here's the thing that I think makes it so brilliant is that watching young Frankenstein gives you pretty much everything that you get out of watching the original say son of Frankenstein or the original Frankenstein films the 1930s films you get the atmosphere you get the imagery this dark uh, or this stark black and white film which if I'm if I've got my facts straight in my distant memory um Young Frankenstein was the first major film to intentionally uh, scrap color and go back to black and white. Until that point, every major film uh, with access to color only shot in color and in even lower level films were doing everything they could to shoot in color. And that one intentionally shot in black and white and that really freaked people out. Now, some of you film buffs uh, out there might point out where I'm wrong about this, but I'll say it's true according to my source. I just can't remember my source because <laughs> it was years ago. Um, so that it give it it feel it gives you it has every element of watching one of the old films, and there's even some like somewhat scary moments. 
not too, not really scary, but neither were the original films either. Uh, it gives you great emotional acting in the way that the old ones did. The comedy also gets cheesy, but the old ones were too. And so it gives you everything that the original was in addition to gags and jokes and comedy. I think it's, it's fantastic. And it's about, it's about as good as you can expect any, any, f- comedy to ever be or is it achieves everything it sets out to achieve plus a whole different category of achievements it gets those two um so i would say oh man well i wanted to talk a little bit about robert de niro's portrayal of the monster um and and others there was one version of of the monster that i did like it was um, in a TV series called Penny Dreadful, but then they killed him off right away. And so I stopped watching the show immediately because I was mad <laughs> that I lost my good, uh, my only other good version of, of the monster. But <clears throat> really, I guess all, all I would do to discuss those things, other than pointing out some of the really cool decisions that they made, is saying once again what I really wanted out of it was to take me back to my original vision of this horrifyingly beautiful, oversized marble sculpture come alive, classic marble sculpture come alive, like like those big uh, humanoid creatures in Ridley Scott's Prometheus. That's my Frankenstein's monster, or I'll say it in the way that makes everybody mad. That's my version of Frankenstein. Um, so with that said, maybe I'll... Maybe I'll I didn't talk about the heartbreaking moment. Okay, one last point because we're we're well beyond what I planned for my forty minutes, um, or we're well beyond my my standard arbitrary deadline of forty minutes. I try to keep it at that because that's about one long commute or two commutes. So that's a little bit of uh, behind the curtains on my logic there for this podcast. The part that gets me so much that I have trouble reading it and rereading it to this day out of the original Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein novel is right after the monster wakes up or is animated and Victor Frankenstein sees it and is so horrified. He, he thought it was beautiful just seconds before life came into it. And then it opens its eyes and makes a sound and looks at him. And that's when he sees what it is he has done. And it's, it's absolutely horrifying to him. And so he flees from his workshop and he goes up to his room and he just takes a nap. (laughs) He stress naps (laughs) over this thing. And which uh, immediately makes you hate Victor Frankenstein. There's no coming back from you do something and you freak out and you just run away and take a nap. Who does that? (laughs) But he wakes up and the monster has like wandered around in terror because you are newly born to this world as intelligent as anything else but this blank slate. And and if he had been greeted with love and education, uh, it seemed, that's the suggestion anyway, but if nothing else, love and, and shown around the world, he could have been the ubermensch, the superman, the, the great the great ideal of the enlightenment era, which liked to think of everybody as, uh, the enlightenment era, like to think of human beings as these vessels of light and rationality that have the potential, uh, to be these transcendent beings through education and enlightenment in one way or another through logic, through science, through study, um, through careful thinking, through choosing the right types of ethical systems. And it also kind of takes for granted that everyone comes into this world as this blank slate and you can have all these things with the right type of, say, study or education. And so Mary Shelley gives us that a full grown, perfect human being with a brilliant mind and a blank slate but 
he comes into a world that is neglectful and self-serving and petty and absent. And so he wanders through this house, this pitiful thing, trying to find out what's going on. And he finds that face that he first saw asleep in the bed and he, and he wakes him and Victor Frankenstein wakes up and sees that and he's not so much horrified this time as disgusted and so he just leaves and goes to a friend's house to stay for a few nights and the monster is sitting there watch or standing there watching this thing this creator waiting for anything and all he needs is one slight positive sign or anything and it will totally change his trajectory and all he gets is the reaction of disgust and abandonment and then that's it and then he's left on his own in this cruel world oh it breaks my heart every time i really can't take it (laughs) it's hard it's making me sad just talking about it right here um it's a fantastic novel in in that way and i think absolutely uh, one that you should study for one reason or another, wh- however much you're into monsters. Um, okay, lots we didn't get to talk. I never got around to talking about golems or homunculi or even Rocky Horror Picture Show. I suppose we'll have to let those wait until future episodes because I'm sure all that stuff's going to come back up again. Well, anyway, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, I hope you learned something or enjoyed something out of today's episode. And if you made it this far, congratulations, because you just survived another episode of The Monster Professor. Monster Professor.